Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and welcome to tonight's science lectures. Uh, and these are hosted this year by the uh, College of Arts and Sciences here at Boston University through the good graces of the department chair for the astronomy department, Teresa Brainerd, and we thank her very much. Here in the Boston, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> <Stand> <laughs> Here in the Boston Cambridge area, Professor Max Tegmark is a popular spokesman for the universe and may need little or no introduction, but will provide some background details for everyone and certainly for those who may be hearing him tonight for the first time. You're in for a treat. Max Tegmark hails from Sweden and received his PhD in physics from the University of California, Berkeley in 1994. After working as a research associate at Max Planck Institute in Munich, he became a Hubble Fellow and a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton before joining the MIT Department of Physics in 2004. He was also tenured at the University of Pennsylvania, but MIT successfully lured him here to Cambridge. Dr. Tegmark is famous for a number of things, among them his keen mathematical perspective of the realities of the cosmos and, of course, for parallel universes. He might share some of these insights with us tonight. And of course, um, he's worked on a number of different levels, and he's famous for his association with a number of very famous uh, physicists, including the late John Wheeler. Professor Tegmark has won a number of awards. We've listed some on our website, and in, he's included a shared first prize in Science Magazine's Breakthrough of the Year in 2003. In addition to a spectacular output of academic articles, and I do mean spectacular, many of them frequently cited, Professor Tegmark has written many articles for the general public. For this, he deserves much credit. It takes great skill to translate for the non-specialists these very abstract concepts associated with the nature of the universe and reality in general. You can find a list of his articles of, that have been published in Scientific American, in New Scientist, and other magazines on his MIT website, and also we've listed on our Science for the Public website as well. He's been featured also in a number of documentaries about the universe, such as the BBC's Horizon series and also in the documentary Parallel Worlds, Parallel Lives about the famous physicist uh, Hugh Everett. Tonight, Dr. Tegmark takes us for a grand tour through the history of the universe, as he says, in one hour, after which he'll be happy to answer your questions. It is a huge pleasure to have Dr. Tegmark with us tonight. Please welcome him. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for uh... And thank you so much for those way, way, way too uh, kind words. I don't want to hear any more of this Dr. Tegmark business. Just call me Max. I am a, just a very ordinary guy who often misplaces his car keys. And <laughs> I'm simply doing this because I just love cosmology. It is just so much fun to get to be a small part of this adventure to try to understand our universe a little bit better. Here is our universe. Don't pop it, because <laughs> it's the only one we have here. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about what that is a little bit later. And basically what I want to do is share with you some of the things that I'm most excited about regarding our universe um, and perhaps others. The t title of, of this talk is The History of Our Universe in, in One Hour. So our universe 
is about 13.7 billion years old. So if I'm going to cover it in um, about 58 minutes or so, I'm going to have to speak <laughs> pretty fast. So what I think I'm going to do instead is actually cover the, his the whole history of the universe even faster and leave a little bit of time to put it all a bit in context and talk about um, some of the great mysteries I think face us as well. <laughs> I'm very happy to see that there are so many people here who are much younger than the universe. <laughs> That's absolutely great. What's particularly cool, I think, is that we humans have pondered these big questions about the history of our universe for as long as we've been on this planet, about 100,000 years in our present form. And even as recently as when th those of you who are nine were born, you know, we were still arguing to some extent whether our universe was 10 billion years old or 20 billion years old. Now we're arguing about whether the universe is 13.7 billion years old or 13.8 billion years old. So in your lifetime, even the very youngest members of our audience, huge progress has been made. And that's one of the reasons I think this is such a cool and exciting field. So what is it exactly that we have figured out so far about this universe of ours? Well, let's begin by just uh, reminding ourselves of what we've learned about our place in space. So if we could for a moment just get the, all the lights off, then we're, oh, that's okay. I think that we can see this pretty clearly. So let's, go, let's begin going um, as close to home as we can without, uh, without burning ourselves. Ouch, that's not good. <laughs> and let's just remind ourselves you know, of the basic scales of our universe. So as, you know, as many of you know, it takes about eight minutes for light to go from the sun out to Earth's orbit here. So if you see the sun tomorrow, and it were to suddenly blow up or something, you wouldn't actually notice for eight minutes because you're seeing it's on eight minutes in the past. Similarly, if we zoom out to the outer solar system, Neptune, Pluto, and so on, you know, it takes hours for light to get there. So if you're on your cell phone with a buddy on Pluto, it's actually pretty boring. You're like, hey, how's it going? And then <laughs> three hours later, your friend hears you and answers, and then maybe another three hours later, you hear back. So who thinks our solar system is big? Raise your hand. Okay, well, let's see if I can change your mind. So let's zoom out now. So our whole solar system shrinks down into this, this little dot. We're looking now at a three-dimensional map of the stars in the neighborhood of our solar system. So every, other, every white dot here is a sun, just like our own. Some a little bigger, some a little smaller. And the size here now is such that it's taken a few hundred years for light to come from many of these. So if it's clear when you come outside here tonight, then you look at one of these stars, if there's someone there looking back at you, they're not going to see you. But they might see, for example, the Boston Tea Party taking place. Something that happened you know, a couple of hundred years ago. This is not a simulation, not a computer simo. It's a real three-dimensional map that astronomers around the world have painstakingly built up. And when my grandma was a kid, this was the, our universe, basically, a bunch of stars. But now we, realize, now we know and we've known this since 1925, that these stars are all just part of this much, much larger and grander structure we call our Milky Way galaxy. So we've discovered that our Earth is just part of this bigger, bigger thing, the solar system. Our solar system is part of this much bigger thing, the Milky Way, with hundreds of billions of stars. And here it's just so huge that it takes about 100,000 years for light to go from one side to the other. So raise your hand now if you still think our solar system is big. Okay, who thinks our galaxy is big? Let me convince you that even our galaxy maybe isn't so big in the cosmic perspective. Because let's zoom out. So our whole galaxy shrinks down to a little dot. Those other white dots you see here now are not stars anymore. They're galaxies, other galaxies. Each one of them with hundreds of billions of stars, perhaps. And let me, for a moment, pretend that I can drive as fast as I want through space, take you for a little ride. Again, we see that we're part of something even grander. Our galaxy is part, gal the galaxies are part of these clusters, groups, super clusters, and sort of giant filamentary structures. So just like you, many people like to hang out with other people, galaxies are the same. The force of gravity <laughs> has created these beautiful patterns throughout space, which We've had a great deal of fun in recent years trying to map out in three dimensions. 
And if I zoom out still more, you can, uh, you can see what a truly enormous kind of set of structures we are part of here, where it takes hundreds of millions of years for light to go from one part to the other. It's only when you zoom out still more that you see that our universe is really a cube. <laughs> This is, of course, just a very cheap pitch for more funding for science, so we, so we can make bigger maps. I have, in fact, had the great luck to get to be part of a project making an even more ambitious map, the, the so-called Sloan Digital Sky Survey Project. That's um, what Yvonne meant, one, one of the things Yvonne mentioned there in the intro. But even there, we've only mapped a small fraction of everything which exists out there so far. Another way to appreciate just how vast and amazing our cosmos is is to look at this picture of the entire sky. And can someone tell me what this constellation is that you see here? Big Dipper. Okay, that's right, the Big Dipper. So let's just zoom in on a small part of the sky near the Big Dipper and look how much detail there is. Okay? This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey I mentioned. You can go home and do this yourself on Google Sky because we've given away for free all of, this, of all this data. And you can zoom in anywhere you want at this level of magnification. So just imagine how much stuff there is out there. We've mapped now about a billion different objects, stars and galaxies in, in 3D. And um, now to really understand this though, our place in the cosmos, it's not enough to just talk about our place in space. We also have to talk about our place in time. Because as I said, if you're talking to someone on Pluto, you know, you're or looking at them, you're seeing the way they were in the past. If you look at things which are really far away, like some of these galaxies in this picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, you're looking at some things, some galaxies, 12, the way they were 12 or 13 billion years ago. So what would it look, what would Earth have, if they looked at Earth, what would Earth have looked like 13 billion years ago? Anyone? Not yeah? Exactly, nothing. nothing. Exactly, because we have only been here for like four and a half billion years. So this is really far away. Now, when we look far, far away, if we look further and further away, we see more galaxies, more galaxies, more galaxies, more of the same. So it's easy to start thinking it's just the same everywhere because we humans like to generalize, overgeneralize. But actually, that's not the case. So looking really far away, it's a bit like if I were to look out in this room here, and I would see the most senior members of the audience in the front row, and then like teenagers, and then all of you guys under 10 sitting in the, back, in the second farthest row, and only babies in the back row. That's what the universe looks like. You can see that the most distant galaxies actually look a lot younger. They're smaller, not so developed yet. And if you look really far away, there are no galaxies at all there anymore because you're looking so far back in time that the galaxies hadn't been born. And um, that, in other words, when you look really far back, as in this, beyond a certain distance, there are no galaxies at all. There's just a bunch of hydrogen gas out of which later all these galaxies and stars and planets and so on were formed. And beyond that, you see something even more weird. You see... It, it's a weird glow. It's as if in the back row here behind all the babies, I would see that the back wall was shining at, at me with this strange radiation, which comes to me as microwaves. What is that? What is the deal with that? It's very strange stuff. It's gotten the Nobel Prize twice now, but what is it? <laughs> well, this black stuff between the galaxies that I always thought was a vacuum when I was a little kid, that it was nothingness, is actually gas, hydrogen gas. And it, one of the things we've discovered by looking for into space is that everything far away is flying apart from us. Everything is expanding away. If you take gas and you expand it, it cools off. That's how our refrigerators work. That's how our air conditioners work. So if you imagine time going backwards, you look, we're looking farther and farther into the past. Things were more and more squished together. This gas was hotter and hotter and hotter. If you take ice and you make it hotter, it turns into what? Water, Water liquid. If you take a liquid and make it really hot, it turns into what? Gas. 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 If you take a gas and make it really hot, it turns into what? Plasma. plasma. So the hydrogen turns into a plasma. And you have this 
And that's what this is. Because the plasma of hydrogen is actually not transparent. It's opaque. So it's like I look through all this transparent hydrogen, and boom, here's an opaque plasma screen. And the funniest thing of all is you don't just, of course, see it behind the galaxies on that side. But in all directions you look, when you look sufficiently far back in time, the hydrogen is so hot, it's opaque like a plasma, and it really looks to us like we're surrounded by the, this plasma ball. So who has the universe that I threw around right now? You can just hold it up. You don't have to throw it back. Yeah, that is, these are just photos. This is just, really what this is, is the fo is photography of the inside of this plasma screen which surrounds us. Okay? Even though, of course, it's harder to printed on the beach ball that way. We call this the cosmic microwave background because when the glow from this plasma reaches us, it's microwaves, the same kind that you have in your ovens at home. That's why it took a while to detect because you need a microwave telescope. These are what we often call baby pictures of our universe because it's the most distant thing we can see. It's opaque so we can't see what lies beyond. And our universe as we know it was only about 400,000 years old then when the light from this was given off. So to summarize the history where we have learned about our place in space and our place in time in just a single slide, let me show you this. So basically, we know that something really strange happened 13.7 billion years ago. We have a nice name for it, we call it our Big Bang, but the truth is we really have no clue exactly what happened. However, we know a great deal about what happened after that, largely because we can see most of this with our telescopes by looking at different distances. So what is it that's happened during those 13.7 billion years that we can see? Well, there are two basic things which have been happening all along. One is this expansion stuff. Everything has been flying apart from everything else, which has taken this gas and made it transform it from being dense to less dense, more diluted, from being hotter to cooler. Our universe right now is pretty chilly. It's about three degrees above absolute zero, which is cold even by Swedish standards. <laughs> That's one process, this expansion. Okay? A second process, which is equally important, is a transition from smooth to clumpy, or equivalently from boring to interesting. Because if you went back to shortly after the beginning here, it was just really dull. You, it was very much like the air in this room. You had this gas everywhere. It was about the same amount of gas everywhere. Who can raise your hand if you can hear me? Okay, so can someone under 15 tell me why you can hear me? Yeah? Because you're making sound waves. Yes, exactly. I'm making waves in the air, right? So that means that there's a little bit more air in some places than others. If you measure how much more, it's about a thousandth of a percent more in some places than others. So the density is, in geek speak, 10 to the power minus 5 more in some places than others. And that's if I speak about this loud and you measure about this far from my mouth. And that is pretty much exactly how it was back then. All the gas that filled our universe was about this smooth, not perfectly uniform, but almost. And then gravity messed this all up and made it more and more clumpy and gradually amplified this tiny, tiny, tiny sound waves from early on into these big clumps, the galaxies and the stars and the planets that we have adorning our universe today. So those are the two processes which have been going on during the last 13.7 billion years. Gravity is the key force which has been responsible for both of them. And it's been really amazing in the last 10 years how We've been able to measure all this much, much more accurately and get a nice quantitative picture of it. So let me summarize everything I've said about the history of our universe now in just a little bit more of a, of a graphic or visual form. Okay? So let's first look at this supercomputer simulation from Ben Moore and his group in Potsdam, Germany, where they've just put in the laws of gravity into a supercomputer and made it go poof. You see stuff flying apart, the expansion I talked about, and also the clumping, where things are getting more and more messy and interesting. Let me show you another version of this movie, where I'm just artificially not showing you the expansion, so you can see how something very smooth gradually gets clumpy. Okay? This is a huge cube. This is 
several hundred million light years from side to side. And it's pretty easy to understand why gravity makes things more messy. Because if you have it, everything completely uniform, then it has to stay that way forever. There's no reason gravity is going to make a clump in one place rather than another. The symmetry is preserved. But if there's a little bit more stuff here than in the, in the vicinity, then the gravitational pull from that is going to draw in still more stuff there. Well, then the gravity gets even stronger, and it can draw in still more stuff, and the gravity gets still stronger, it draws in still more stuff, and before you know it, you formed a huge clump like a galaxy. It's a bit like economics, that those who have a lot of money tend to get even more money. If you have a lot of mass, you can steal a lot of ma more mass from around you. Let's zoom in now on one of those galaxy-sized clumps with another supercomputer simulation and see a little bit what happens. This one is from uh, Matthias Steinmetz and his group in Potsdam, Germany. And what you're seeing here is a top view on the left of the same part of space that you're seeing on a side view over here. And he's put into his computer program not just the laws of gravity, but also some gas physics. So when the gas gets really, really hot, it starts to shine. When the gas gets really, really hot in a particular place, it starts doing nuclear fusion reactions and turns into a star, and you see more and more stars are born here. And um, the story of how galaxies like our Milky Way are born is still very, very active research. And it's fair to say that there are many fascinating open questions, and Teresa Willemsen here, for example, can tell you a lot more about this. Uh, but one thing we've learned is that it's, it's not like with the solar system, that our, galaxy, that our solar system really formed very quickly four and a half billion years ago and then basically sat here. Rather, it's more like an ongoing series of traffic accidents on the I-95, where every time you think you've made the thing, another big chunk of thing, stuff comes and crashes in here. And if you look around with a telescope right now in the sky, you see that the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is actually busy, is being cannibalized right now by, by the Milky Way and being eaten up. Now, as we start to approach the present time, you see that finally it starts to look a little bit like a, a, a rotating spiral galaxy from the top, and it's looking like the new hot stars are forming a sort of pizza-shaped disk here. The older stars and also this invisible stuff called dark matter forms more of a, of a spherical blob around the whole thing. Let's zoom in even more and take a look here at... Um, what happens in a small part of this, where we have what we, what we were hearing from you about here, a gas cloud is trying to form a solar system. So it's spinning around, gravity again tries to squish it, but it can't squish it into a point because of the spin or angular momentum of it. So it forms sort of a pancake. Eventually it gets so hot and little that it starts to shine. Nuclear fusion reactions begin here. And in the meantime, the pancake gas clumps into planets in the outer parts of this disk which become revealed once this newborn star blows away this, this disk of gas from which it was born. And you, when you look around in our solar system, you see all the planets are going around in the same direction, which is the same direction that the sun is spinning, which is exactly what you would expect from this picture, where all the rotation is coming from this original gas cloud. Right? This, whereas the previous things I showed were all very scientific calculations, this last one was an artist's rendition. Which, show, which means that there's still a lot of work to, do, to be done to fully understand how this all happens. So even for those of you under 10, there's a lot of exciting science that we're counting on you to do, okay? Let's zoom in a little bit more. We're looking at Earth here. And I'm just showing this to remind you that even Earth is changing. Our, we went from being one single continent to being where we are now in 200 million years. You can see on the lower right the, the time here. And I used to think that 200 million years was just a really long time. <laughs> but now I've learned that it's, realize it's not. That's less than a few percent of the age of a universe. Right? So that was the very brief version of how uh, Boston University got here. <laughs> so I've told you a story of the history, how we got here, the history of our universe, 13.7 billion years in about 26 minutes and 38 seconds. 
Now, so this is a good story. But why should you believe a word of it? This is a very important question to ask, especially in a day and age when we have politicians who uh, don't <laughs> and, and are, t are insisting that the universe was created about 6,000 years ago, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, and that um, these distant galaxies that I showed you are just a hoax. And uh, so, so why should you take seriously what I'm saying? If I had to answer this question in just one word, that word would be data. It's been, it used to be that cosmology was a very speculative field. You could get together with your friends and have some beer or some, some um, cranberry juice, if you're <laughs> more the, in the juvenile part of the audience. And then you could speculate and then you could go home. There's nothing really more you could do. And the, and especially in the last decade, we've been so lucky to get terabytes and terabytes of measurements of all sorts of different aspects of this and been able to put together a real quantitative precision picture of what's going on here. And, and, and this transformation of the field of cosmology from being flaky to being really rigorous is so amazing that even my curmudgeon colleagues in Sweden have realized this now and decided to give out some Nobel Prizes for it, most recently this year's Nobel Prize in physics. But I feel that very strongly that the most exciting discoveries in cosmology are still in the future. So I would encourage all of you guys to um, study a lot of science, especially those of you who are still in school, and help figure this out on your own. OK, so this is the first part of, of what I wanted to share with you, my excitement over this wild ride, which has, has been cosmology in the last decade, how we've managed to get a much more precise understanding of, of things. Let me talk now about some of the things we don't understand, some of the great mysteries. If you want to afterwards, when we have questions, you can ask me about other mysteries that I won't talk about here, like dark matter, dark energy, or today's big announcement from CERN about the Higgs particle. But right now, let me, I'm happy to chat about that, but like right now, let me go, explode, go off at the exact same time everywhere without any prior you know, communication. That bothered Alan. Another thing that bothered him was the fact that it seems like this Big Bang explosion was very sort of fine-tuned. If you look at the state of this Big Bang, one nanosecond, one billionth of a second after time zero, and you just change the, if you just change the, the, the density, how much stuff you have in each volume by a teeny tiny amount, you, have, you write it out with this many decimal places, and you change the last decimal from a 6 to a 7, or from a 6 to a 5. It makes a huge difference. In one case, we would have been dead by now, because the whole universe would have crashed back on itself in a black hole. In the other case, it would have flown apart so fast, you wouldn't have really made galaxies. So it's like you have this knob, and somehow it was set to this one very magical va value. And we don't like to have to invoke magic in science. <laughs> To explain things, especially not important big <coughs> things like our universe, right? In that case, if we're going to use magic, then why uh, are we any better than you know Sarah Palin? <laughs> or you, know, you could just say that the universe was created 6,000 years ago, and, and the fossils of the dinosaurs were created too in the ground to trick us, and the light from distant exploding stars were created. It was created in space to make it look like there had been those, you know. And it, it, we don't like to have to make these sort of magical assumptions. We like to have some physical explanation that, 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 for why this all happened. So Alan Guth, here on the left, <laughs> he hates when I show this picture, but I can't resist because I took it. And his colleague Andre Linde they, they, and others, they have developed this really interesting theory called inflation. And it answers all of these questions. And uh, it sounds very crazy, um, but if you, if you just take seriously Einstein's theory of gravity, okay, and then assume one more thing, you assume that there's some weird kind of stuff which has this weird property that if you let it expand out into a bigger volume, it doesn't dilute very much. Now that's strange because if you have like one kilogram of something, of gas or whatever, and you put it into twice the volume, should still be one kilogram, so the density should have dropped by two. But suppose you assume that something does not dilute. 
So it's still the same density. Now you have two kilograms. Okay. Then you're going to get answers to all these questions. Why should you possibly believe that there could be such a thing? Well, because that's what got the Nobel Prize in physics this year. Dark energy, it actually has that, seems to have that property. And what they're saying is, suppose there was also that kind of stuff very, very early on okay, in, the, in the universe. Okay? Give them for a minute the credit. Or just, let's assume that and see where it leads to. Then it leads to this. If you just solve Einstein's gravity equations, you start with one unit of this. This can be tiny, much tinier than an atom. Okay. Okay. I can. I do this in two dimensions, but you should think of a three-dimensional thing. Now it's doubled in size. Now you have four times as much stuff. Now every one of these is going to double. So now you have eight, sixteen times as much stuff. And now you have still more stuff. And all this, every doubling turns out to happen equally often. Okay. So. So in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, like 10 to the minus 34 seconds, you keep doubling, doubling, doubling. If, if, someone tell, if you tell someone to give you $1 and then $2 and then keep giving you twice as many dollars every second, your friend is going to be broke in no time. right? And, but this seems to be exactly what, this is exactly what our universe does. It just keeps doubling its, its mass, doubling its size at regular intervals. So in a tiny fraction of a second, You've gone from something much smaller than an atom to something vastly bigger than everything we can see with our telescopes today. This means that you, can, you don't have to explain why there are so many kilograms to start with of stuff. You just have to assume that for whatever reason there was a teeny tiny amount of stuff. Then you get everything else for free. This also explains why there's a bang. Because I've drawn these little arrows here that show how fast this thing is expanding. Right? If you keep doubling in size, everything is going to be moving very, very fast also, which is exactly what you need. And, and then this business with the coffee cup and the milk, well, if everything started in just this, this tiny, tiny place, it's less crazy now. Everything really was kind of in contact maybe with everything else. And then it was all whoosh, spread apart with great speed by this crazy expansion, which explains when you work through the math why things look so much the same everywhere. And it turns out, if you work on the math also, detail that it even it's this so-called fine-tuning problem of why everything was, was just right. So with just one rather wild-sounding assumption that there's some kind of stuff which doesn't dilute, you get this inflation theory. Now, what's so great about it is it doesn't just answer those things which bothered Alan Guth, but it actually predicts a bunch of stuff you can test. It predicts this, that there's a certain number that's supposed to equal one. So uh, can someone tell me, if I have a triangle with three angles in it, what are they supposed to add up to? Yeah? Three. There are three of them. That's right. One, two, three. That's right. But if, and, if you, and, and if you take the angles of them, like suppose this one is 90 degrees and this one is a little bit less than 90 degrees, maybe 80. Maybe this is 45. This is 40. That's a bad triangle. 40 degrees, 50 degrees. They add all, whatever triangle you do, they will add up to 180 degrees. Well, Einstein said that it doesn't have to be that way. He said if you have a space which is curved, like the surface of, a, of an orange, and you draw a triangle, you can try it at home. On an orange, you can easily draw a triangle which looks kind of like this, where, where everything here is actually as straight as it can be on an orange. But this is 90 degrees, this is 90. You, you can get angles that add up to more than 180. And if you do it, the drawing on a horse saddle or on a Pringles potato chip, the angles will add up to less than 180. Okay? And uh, this theory predicts that they should add up to exactly 180 degrees. And there's a special number that we call omega, the last letter in the Greek alphabet, which is supposed to equal 1 if this theory is correct. Well, the great thing is we can measure that number because it has to do with how dense the universe is and how fast it expands. And, and uh, basically, the way we measure it is we make a really huge triangle in space and add up the angles. We make the biggest triangle we can with one corner on Earth and the other two corners on this plasma screen across the universe, where we can look at those pictures from the cosmic micro background. And what have we found? Well, when we analyze those pictures carefully with all kind of boring, geeky, scientific curves like this, I'm, I'm showing this just to give you 
idea that there, that there's a lot of measurements with small error bars, and there's a theoretical prediction here in red that actually agrees with it. Don't worry about what the axes mean. When we do that, we can put, don't worry, worry about the details of these plots either. I just want to show you at the top here, this is a measurement that uh, my friends and I published by using the, these big triangles and also these galaxy surveys. We measured that this number is equal to 1 with an uncertainty of about, or one, very close to 1, with an uncertainty of 1%. So this made Alan Guth and Andre Linde super happy because this is what they had predicted. <laughs> So right now, it's not fair to say that inflation is proven, that we know that it happened. But it is definitely fair to say that it's the most popular explanation we have for what really happened early on. Okay? There are also a number of some other things that inflation has predicted, which we've also checked. And best of all, there is some stuff it has predicted which we have not yet checked. So we can perhaps rule it out. And we might be able to check next year when a European satellite called Planck is going to finish analyzing even better baby pictures it's taken. So, so this inflation theory uh, is perfectly re respectable scientific theory. And it, we, we, so we take quite seriously what it says. And, and generally, people are quite happy about it. But <laughs> it's like it's, it's this gift that just keeps on giving, even though people want it to stop to some extent. It came in and it solved all our problems. But then it, kept, it also gave us even more things that we hadn't really bargained for. It didn't just give us an explanation for what put the bang into our big bang and so on. But it also has given us parallel universes. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about that. So Yvonne alluded to this in the beginning. This is a really fascinating topic. It's also, so this is a little article I wrote for Scientific American talking about this subject. And there have been a lot of books and articles and so on about it. Brian Greene talks a lot about it in his last book and Michio Kaku. Uh, it's very controversial, too. So some of my friends and colleagues think it's uh, great, like Alec, Professor Alex Vilenkin at Tufts University, who you may have seen or maybe will see in one of your Yvonne's future events. Uh, he thinks it's inevitable. Then there are other colleagues of mine, like Professor Paul Steinhardt from Princeton here, who will say, this isn't science. You know, and even uh, pe people sometimes even disagree with their own thesis advisor. Like <laughs> Frank Wilczek, who's a colleague of mine over at, uh, Nobel Pro at MIT, who got the Nobel Prize some years ago. He thinks it makes sense, but uh, and Lisa Randall is pretty cool with it. But David Gross, who was the thesis advisor of Frank Wilczek, and shared the Nobel Prize with him, he says, I hate it. I have to give him, he's changed actually from saying, this makes no sense and I hate it, to saying, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's a very, very big change coming from a scientist. But, and then there are these inflation guys, obviously, who love it. So before we talk more about parallel universes, though, there is a very, very important question I have to raise, which is just the philosophical part of this here. You know. So to me, what we're really asking is simply, is there more that exists you know, than, than what we can see? In other words, I mean, this ostrich doesn't see everything that exists. Are we maybe making a similar mistake? Well, what, before talking about parallel universes, we need to be clear on what we mean by our universe. So where is our universe? All right. Perfect. So this is what we usually mean when we talk about our universe. It contains all the space that we can see, even in principle. This is the spherical region of space from which light has had time to get here so far during these 13.7 billion years. If space goes on beyond this, which we have every reason to think it does, then by definition, then, there are parallel universes. Um, there could also be... A, other kinds of parallel universes, and I'm happy to take questions about that. But for now, let's just ask whether we should think this is all there is or whether there are a lot more of these. So if this is our universe, what I like to call the level one parallel universes are other pieces of regions of space of the same size. 
Okay. So in inflation actually has something very interesting to say about this. The theory of inflation doesn't just predict that this number of should be one and, and a bunch of other things. It also predicts that space itself isn't just really, really big, but infinitely big. Okay? Infinitely big. And if it is infinitely big, then there are infinitely many other regions of the same size, right? And that has some really crazy implications, which I'll come back to in a moment. Good cat. Uh, how can inflation make an infinitely big, infinitely big uh, space in a, in, only, in a finite amount of time? I will tell you about that if you ask me about it during the question session. But for now, let's just look at the implications. Suppose space is infinite. You know, that's what Euclid had in mind when he came up with Euclidean space. That's how I thought space was when I was nine years old. I figured it goes on forever because if it didn't, you know, well, that would be kind of weird. Would it, just be an, would it just end somewhere with a sign saying, like, space ends here, you know, mind the gap? And if so, what's on the other side? So it's kind of natural to think it's infinite. Suppose for whatever reason, inflation or otherwise, it just is infinite. Then you have infinitely many different infinitely many regions of space, which are this big. Nothing weird happening at the boundaries, but you know, there are that many volumes. And um, it also turns out that from quantum physics that there's only a finite, there's only so many ways in which you can arrange all the particles in a finite volume. There are a lot of ways in which you can do it, but only finitely many. Inflation also predicts that the way the particles start out in any one region it's sort of random. So for the particles start out and then spread out in different patterns in each of these regions, kind of at random. So no matter how unlikely it is that they get arranged, the particles, in exactly such a way that was needed to make our particular universe and our galaxies and, the pl and our planets and us, the probability isn't zero because it's happened here, right? So if, you're gonna, if you get to roll the dice infinitely many times, it's going to happen again and again. And again, infinitely many times over. You can calculate that you have to go no more than about a Googleplex meters away until you come to the nearest universe which is identical to ours, where a Googleplex is one with a Google zeros after it, and a Google is one with a hundred zeros. So that's pretty far. Um, but in an infinite space, it's nothing. Uh, long before you come to another universe which is just like ours, there is, you'll come to one which looks a lot like this with a public lecture being given by Max Schmegmark. <laughs> and there'll be maybe peop, versions, people there who look a lot like you but have different names, or even people who look exactly like you and have had the same experiences up until now. But maybe in that one, suddenly, you know, and a, stray el a stray donkey, you know, walks in through the door here, and, and from then on, things start going kind of differently. It's a very crazy sort of uh, idea that it, everything that could happen according to the laws of physics actually does happen. But uh, that is a fairly direct prediction of this theory of, of, an, of inflation. So in other words, if space is infinite, then you have all these other regions of space with the same laws of physics, but things just started out a little bit differently in each one of them. And uh, this didn't uh, go down so well when Giordano Bruno first talked about infinite space and life elsewhere, because he got burnt at the stake in the year 1600. <laughs> so far, the rest of us have lucked out a little bit better. There are also, if you think that was crazy, even more crazy kinds of things, called uh, the level two parallel, the level two multiverse, the level three multiverse, the level four multiverse, and so on. You're welcome to ask me about that. In the, as soon as we finish here, if you, ha if you have such inclinations. Before then, I want to just share one last uh, reflection with you, which is a more of a philosophical one, which I think many of us have pondered in the past. So my own personal story here is sort of interesting, because the more I learned about our universe, the more insignificant I felt. You know, the more I realized I kept realizing that things were still bigger than I thought they were, and then bigger yet. So I kept feeling oh, just smaller and smaller and more and more point, uh, irrelevant. 
But then something happened and I completely changed my mind. And I want to share with you <laughs> why it was I turned around 180 degrees and try to persuade you that you're not insignificant at all. Okay, so this is pretty big, this universe, right? Our universe. And we're a lot smaller than it. You know, there's 10 to the 78 particles in here. That's a lot. However, I think, and I'm happy to explain why if you want to ask about it during the question session, I think that we are the only life in this entire volume advanced enough to have telescopes. Okay? It's a con controversial opinion, but I'm happy to defend it. Now, Let's for a moment just explore that hypothesis. Suppose we are alone in this here. You know, maybe there are some other planets which have something like cows on them or whatever, but those will not be aware that there are galaxies. Right? They'll be aware of the grass on their planet and stuff like that. Uh, then, when we look at these beautiful galaxies that we flew around about, you know, why are they, be why are they beautiful? They're beautiful because somebody is conscious of them, because of our consciousness perceiving them. That's why they're beautiful, right? If we weren't aware of their existence, nothing or nobody would be aware of them. They would just be a giant waste of space, as far as I'm concerned. So in that sense, you know, we may be small, but it is you guys who give meaning to all of this. Just a bunch of rocks out there and hydrogen atoms, they don't have any meaning on their own. That makes our little planet here and us self-aware beings on it very, very special. Now, that's our place. So this is a very special place in space, planet Earth. But we're also in a very, very special place in time. You know, living for 100 years is pretty good if you eat your vitamins and stuff. But that doesn't sound very long compared to 13.7 billion years, right? It's like a spark in, in, in eternity. But, what are we doing there? 50, good. But I, I, would, I also believe that this is a very, very special time we're living in right now. Because on one hand, we have developed in our lifetime, basically, the technology needed to, uh, learn to uh, take life beyond this planet and, and start spreading it into space. And there's nothing at all in the laws of physics that say you know, this is the end point of life that this is as good as it can possibly get. In fact, if you take seriously cosmology, it's pretty absurd to think of us, humans, as the, the end point of, of evolution of life. We would all agree, it would be as, if there is still life around five billion years from now, right, it's likely that that life will be as much more advanced than us as we are compared to a cockroach or an amoeba. Right? That's where we were that billions and billions of years ago. So I think, I think uh, there's an enormous future opportunity for life if we get our act together. Things more beautiful and grandiose than we could ever imagine can happen. It's totally, totally allowed by the laws of physics. At the same time, within the, within the last century, we've also developed, for the first time, the technology to just wipe ourselves out completely. Right? And you all know from following the news that we humans do a lot of stupid stuff. Okay? And I, I think it's pretty clear that we cannot just muddle along like we are now, doing all kind of stupid stuff, you know, all these very, very dangerous technologies for an indefinite period of time. Either we're going to get our act together more permanently, or we're going to just wipe ourselves out. I would be surprised if we can muddle along like this even for another century without it going kind of one way or the other. I feel that life in the universe has come to this very important fork in the road. You know, either we get our act together and even more wonderful things happen or game over. And where and when in this grand universe is this decision going to happen? Which of the two paths of the fork we're going to take? Well, where it's going to happen on our planet, Earth. Right? And when is it going to happen? I think it's going to happen in your lifetime. And who is it who's going to make the difference? It's you guys. So not only do I feel that you guys are not insignificant, I feel that what you do with your lives in your lifetime 
is the most significant thing ever to happen in a sense for determining the whole future of our universe. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>